It's the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world as we know it. And I feel fine. The popular song created in 1987 by R.E.M. has a, quite a catchy chorus, followed by quick wordy verses of profound nonsense that mirror the disjuncture of the time, eventually tumbling back to the coherent declaration of the chorus. It's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. And it does feel like the end of the world, but we feel anything but fine. We here in this room and those watching are drawn to notice and respond to the suffering we sense in the planet, in people, in beings great and small during these times. The gun violence, the displacement of human beings and animals, the oceanic indicators noting climactic danger, the robotic and automotive takeover that is really responsible for displacing people from jobs, not each other, but pitting us against each other at this time. At times it can feel like the end of the world as we know it means annihilation, the destruction of everything we love. And in the US's current pre-fascist pre-war moment, so much harm and oppression divides our communities and our social movements. And the compounding systems of extraction are traumatic to people, destroying the planet and weighing on the spiritual fabric of all of our communities. And so in the face of this, we either, like the song says, feel fine via coping mechanisms that numb and distract, strike out or insulate, or we do not feel fine. Resisting the urge to consume ourselves to sleep, we grieve, we strategize, organize, and write, participating however we can in movements to slow down the damage. And I want to acknowledge the hard work everyone here in this room and watching is doing. I hope that what I say today can encourage you in your thinking and actions on any level to deepen your commitments to nonviolence, religious practice, and peacemaking so that you can act with integrity and power at this time in our collective story. Wherever Christianity has spread, some have used the book of Revelation to predict that the days they were living in were the last days and the end of the world. We cannot know for sure what the future holds, and I am not here to predict. In fact, I want to reclaim revelation from how it has been used to make claims about what the end times will be like, because the process of making those claims has often been harmful. It's influenced dispensationalist believers to not get involved in what is happening in society around them, suggesting they need not care much about the planet because their primary concern is with believing certain things in order to be saved and to go to a place away from here. Yet, in its original language, the word revelation is apocalypse. This Greek word means to unveil, to expose, and to reveal. Understanding revelation is much less about prediction and much more about analysis, vision, and inspiration. And we here at this time can use some of that type of revelation. Ancient stories and modern data to help us analyze what's going on around us to envision alternatives, and to inspire ourselves and others to commit strongly to make the necessary adjustments now to contribute to the possible continuation of complex life forms here on this planet. Here on this planet. Here. The genre of apocalyptic writing was widespread when John, a wise elder in the religious phenomenon later known as Christianity, was incarcerated in Patmos prison back around 80 Common Era. So what was the particular content he wrote in his visionary letter of Apocalypsis? Who did he write it to? What were they going through? He wrote to a cluster of small faith-based affinity groups 
And these groups met regularly to bring radical, inclusive social change to their cultures and societies. They were part of the second wave of a grassroots movement based on the renewal that Jesus of Nazareth called for, the radical oneness he embodied, the relationships he encouraged, and the revolution of values he demanded. They were meeting in the context of a Roman military and economic occupation of the Mediterranean Sea area, a government focused on crushing resistance and dissent. And when John wrote about the end of the world as he knew it, the Romans had just destroyed the central Jewish temple in Jerusalem, scattering the area's inhabitants and changing the dynamics for that fledgling movement. The emergent church leaders from the original crew of Jewish Palestinian based leadership who had not been assassinated or silenced were still active, but the movement was quite decentralized. And across the movement spread, it advocated for a redistribution of wealth and peace. It was flourishing on the underground in many places, in great diversity, and facing great adversity. But it was because of apocalyptic letters like this one that these communities under duress could hold to a vision where sparkling rivers flowed clear, horsemen of destruction were overcome, and spirits and music reverberated throughout the atmosphere. It inspired them not only to envision what lay beyond their current difficult moment, but to understand the historical context and design and practice of collective ethics that aligned with this revelation vision. And while the legacy of these early church groups, their community cultivation, their rejection of violence and dominant power, and their dream of a world renewed did not become the mainstream expression of Christianity, this movement culture has survived on the margins of the church and society through till today. And people like Martin Luther King Jr. picked up on this, naming the triple evils of the time, racism, militarism, and materialism, he drew upon prophetic texts like Revelation and called for an end to practices of domination and oppression. He knew the changes to build a beloved community would end the world as people with privilege knew it, but he believed it would be for the better, much better. Of course, the people with privilege fought hard against him terrorizing many communities and assassinating him and many others in leadership who said they were willing to give their lives to save the soul of America. 2018 is 50 years since 1968. Those two were apocalyptic times. And I think these are apocalyptic times. Whether Christian or not, we all have access through our shared humanity to the legacy of Jesus and King and many others to help us during these revelatory times. Movements here and worldwide are unmasking the nefarious inner workings of dominant crushing power. Those who have experienced societal comfort but want to make a change are being exposed as opportunists or they really are risking their status and sacrificing their privilege to truly act in solidarity with the marginalized. It is abundantly clear that all of us must bring forth what is deepest in our shared humanity to face these threats to life together. If we don't, if we don't, then what? We hear know in our bones that we cannot keep up business as usual. That the earth is breaking down and busting out under the weight of our militarized systems that enshrine endless growth and protect corporate profit over the lives of the masses and other than human species with whom we share this fragile planet. And peace studies students are looking at how the current systems for things are outdated. You all are examining colonial funding structures that NGOs have that have created dependency rather than autonomy. You're changing retributive justice systems to the restorative transitional ones we need. You're challenging exploitative labor practices and exclusive family definitions that don't allow for spaciousness and support to raise children. You're protesting the impunity with which, with which environmental justice activists are killed. This is all crucial. 
But an area we have not studied much is sanitation. And just like all these other areas of study, the current systems are unequipped for the current challenges. If we don't take a look at this area of defecatory justice, then we can flush peace now and in the future down the toilet. The area of sanitation is where I believe that the violence of the interlocking systems of oppression is unseen and routine. On one hand, you have the lack of adequate facilities for 2.5 billion people. And on the other, an excess, the practice of urination and defecation in fresh water in the global north. The sanitation crisis is today's apocalypse. Unless you are using a waterless toilet or a closed loop system or a composting toilet, those of us here participate daily in perpetuating this crisis. Outdated sewage systems are being exposed and ecological solutions are being revealed. But why isn't there as much conversation about it as with other needs on Maslow's lowest rung of the hierarchy of needs? Food, water, air, etc. The reason we don't talk about sanitation is because it's taboo to talk about poop. From little on up, we are told not to use bathroom words in the formal Western public, as it creates discomfort because it's not considered polite. English does not even have a neutral word to describe the nutrients and leftovers that come out of our body. The word poo is childish. The word shit offends people, though the word has noble roots. And feces and excrement are too scientific for a normal conversation. Our politeness conventions have gotten us stuck in not talking about it, thereby blocking new ideas from being shared in discourse at every level of society where innovation could be happening. And I believe that our social movements, institutions, organizations, etc., are just like our bowels. When something is stuck, it is not good. We need to get the flow going in order to be healthy. So today, we're just going to plunge in and talk about it. So please bear with me and the range of language that I use. It's similar to addressing HIV AIDS, because just as the HIV and AIDS cannot be addressed without a frank conversation about sex, so sanitation cannot be addressed without a frank conversation about shit. We have to deal with our crap. And if we deal with it, instead of it being the end of the world as we know it in terms of mutual annihilation, it could be the end of the world as we know the status quo, the end of the patriarchal, cis heteronormative, white supremacist, settler, colonial, Christian, hegemonic, monoamorous, US centric, corporate capitalistic, petrochemical, industrial growth society of death status quo. <laughs> and the dawning of a world where all have their basic needs met and we are designing for a holistic existence in the ecosystems around us. To embrace the personal and collective changes required for this welcome end, let us first examine what's going on in the status quo. So on the left hand, many worldwide lack sanitation basics. According to the reporters of the Millennium Development Goals, one in three people, 2.5 billion, still have no stable sanitation facilities. This means no toilet, no bucket, no pit latrine, no porta potty, no box. That's 40% of the world without an adequate crapper. The problem here is that poop carries passengers. If left untreated, such as happens with open defecation, diseases will be passed. One of the main implications of this is diarrhea. What's in the overdeveloped world is usually considered a nuisance that can happen from some bad carryout food. Diarrhea is actually deadly. Over 2,000 children under five years old die a day from diarrhea. And during the time that it takes for us to have this dialogue, 70 young ones will have perished. It's the second biggest killer of children worldwide, 
malaria, HIV, measles. These are all super serious, but diarrhea kills more than all of more children than all of those combined. The euphemisms sometimes classify the causes of diarrhea as waterborne illnesses. And many countries that have sanitation issues spend a lot of their money on fresh water supply. And many NGOs focus on water rather than sanitation because the public image of fresh water springing up out of a pipe is more exciting than showing a stoic, dignified toilet. No one will say no to fresh water, it's important. But without adequate sanitation, the fresh water supply will quickly become contaminated by dirty fingers and feet. When human waste is properly channeled and treated, the risk of infecting drinking water sources is significantly reduced. But because people don't want to talk about excrement and urine, it's taboo. People feel shame. They don't have a Western style toilet. And there's less funding for innovation in this area. Sanitation is the most off track millennium development goal. We're at least 50 years behind on it. So traveling to the other hand, this is why the flush toilet was such a brilliant invention. The readers of the British Medical Journal voted the toilet as the best medical advance of the last 200 years because of the impact that sanitation systems had on reducing disease and reducing child mortality. They chose the toilet over surgery, the pill, anesthesia. And the World Toilet Organization, that's the other WTO, was very happy to hear this. So on the right hand, here in the flushed and plumbed world, you poop and it goes away. I watched a newly potty trained child once who had learned to say bye bye to their poop as it whooshed away. But where is away? There's no place called that. Look at any map. Nowhere I've seen is called away. Somewhere here receives our refuse. But you'd be fooled living here. Global North City and architecture is designed to facilitate separation from the extreme consequences of our mundane actions by the push of a button, the jiggle of a handle, or the click of a mouse. But as there is no away, and as people committed to nonviolence and the diligent study of our interconnectedness, we must care about the place that is away and the people who live there. Though we don't have to go far to find the consequences, actually. People here get sick from contaminated drinking water as a result of fecal particles too. Seven million a year, and 900 die annually in the United States. And a lot of that disease comes from the fact that when it rains hard, our sewage treatment plants are overwhelmed and the poop, the industrial wastewater, and the roadway and field runoff go directly untreated into the river. Here in South Bend and in many cities across the country, there's a combined sewer overflow system. Normally, those lines carry the industrial wastewater, field runoff, roadway runoff, and household wastewater, are treated in a sewage treatment plant, and then discharged into the closest water body. But when sewers meet capacity, like during a major rain event, many systems bypass the treatment plant and dump directly into the environment which is called the combined sewer overflow, to avoid the sewage backup in residential homes. So very frankly, rather than make us deal with what we've dumped, systems are designed to push it all downstream. This has led to fish being contaminated, E. coli blooms, and has seriously compromised the health of the St. Joseph River. Again, South Bend is not alone. Elkhart, Elkhar, Indiana, where I'm from, has the same system, and the Elkhart River flows into the St. Joe. Most famously, this combined sewer overflow cocktail led to the Cuyahoga River catching fire a while ago. And in the 90s, along the coast, there was so much dumping into the oceans that the sewage was suffocating the sea. Groups like MNET, which was born out of research begun by electrical engineers actually right here at Notre Dame, has done creative work. They work by installing a system of sensors and actuators that speak to each other. And they monitor the capacity of a sewer system to see if a potential overflow can be averted. For example, if a rainwater line is reaching capacity, the system can identify other pipes to which runoff can be diverted. 
And the end result is a system that doesn't produce an overflow until it has reached capacity across the board. And so MNET's work since 2010 has helped the city reduce our overflow of excrement, chemicals, and whatever else people put down their drains from nearly 2 billion gallons a year to about 500 million gallons a year. And that led, led Mayor Pete Buttigieg to exclaim that South Bend has the smartest sewers in the world. So smart sewers and upgrades are definitely important. And MNET, which is now Xylem, is working to reduce the overflow even more and coordinate with new infrastructure for the future. And they've expanded to several major cities too. And it's an instructive story of repurposing military technology. But these are technological solutions to combine sewer overflow and to our waterborne treatment system. And I think our issue is actually a social and theological problem at its root. The social problem is that we've chosen to create two problems out of one solution, as the radical agrarian writer Wendell Berry would say. The solution is returning to natural ecological loops. And the problems that we're doing each time are depleting the soil when we eat from it, and then also remove our leftover nutrients. And then we use our most scarce and precious resource to do the dirty work. So currently, as the temperatures are rising and the whole world is looking for fresh water to drink, we sit here and poop in our fresh water. Then we use more resources to separate the poop and the fresh water. The increasing scarcity of clean, fresh water has been a driver for conflict and violence. Finding water to make our combined sewer systems work is going to be more difficult. It's already becoming more expensive. In places where the water table is high, continuing systems that work against nature to push, to push that water table back is counterproductive. Most, if not all, cities with a combined sewer system across the country are being required by the Environmental Protection Agency to enter into long-term control plans in which they agree to spend a sizable chunk of money to take care of the combined sewer overflow issue in their communities. And for many cities, this is the single largest item on the budget. And citizens will be paying directly for this on their water bills well into the future. The current system of going against nature is costing a lot of money. Living in a place where schools and community centers are being closed due to lack of public money, to know how much we're pouring into a sanitation system that doesn't work and is costing taxpayers a lot, when we could put our money into above ground community resources is really frustrating. And when water and sanitation needs cannot be met or met adequately, this creates grievances that can be mobilized in any population. Politics from local to national is already quite contentious now. Yet, we must talk directly about water and sanitation access before it's a larger crisis here even if it's contentious. Moreover, when water becomes unavailable or polluted, this is what we're risking. Human life will come to an end in that place. Many refugees have left home because there is no water or access is controlled by coercion. So as people here who are concerned about preventing war and forced human migration, the solution to sanitation issues cannot be to only provide a flush toilet to everyone or expand the model based on the Global North underground waterborne system that demands a steady volume of water. This would exacerbate already intense solutions worldwide. So we're at a tenuous moment. What can we do? The United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction acknowledges that the climate change most adversely impacts vulnerable populations, calling out the protection gap that leaves those who contribute the least to carbon emissions and to sanitation issues most vulnerable to the negative impacts. The study that Professor Reagan also from here at Notre Dame worked on also speaks to the protection gap. Populations on the front line of climate change do not have the resources to adequately adapt to install those hundreds of thousands of flush toilets. Those resources are not there. Sanitation is another area where those of us in a protective class are having a disproportionate adverse impact. And those on the front lines are having disproportionately having to deal with our crap. 
still the solution is not a matter of then making terrible porta potties or or unhelpful pit latrines that aren't taken care of for the masses to handle the fact that there's not sanitation everywhere. A lot of people could suffer as profit-driven knockoffs expand the same system. It's inaccessible and doesn't work for most. So it's time for a total reframe. And I wanna just pause for a moment to allow for digestion to begin to think about what we can do in terms of total reframe. Just let the words that I've said and your own knowledge metabolize together in your organism and your thinking. Molly Winter calls this reframe advanced body training. Speaking to the need for daily diligence if we want to adjust our habits and our thinking. One part of the reframe is to look for solutions to the world's most pressing issues, sanitation among them, that come from the margins. As those solutions that are inaccessible for folks on the margins, those solutions that are accessible and workable for those on the margins tend to work for everyone. While solutions that work for the center tend to be inaccessible or unworkable for those on the margins. Ecologically speaking, the most threatened and marginalized human beings will generally be found living in similarly threatened ecosystems. To close the protection gap, we must look to the unprotected and learn from their leadership on how they restore their environments by transforming dangerous pollutants into valuable resources to see what we can learn for our environments here. This is also a liberation theology framework. Look to those who are most marginalized within the context of our religious communities and see and learn how God is at work there and allow that spirit then to flow in and to create the structural changes necessary so that we all may be transformed. So putting in the ecosystem analysis and liberation theology together, you have liberation ecology. Haiti is one of the most seriously marginalized countries. As many vulnerable and oppressed communities, um, as one of many vulnerable and oppressed communities, Haitians have been living in apocalyptic times for a while. Systematically punished for a successful 1804 Afrocentric rebuttal to enslavement, it's a country of scrappy geniuses that are hamstrung by the international community, racism, and dramatic internal political struggle and instability. So let's look there. What are they doing? Since 2006, SOIL, Sustainable Organic Live Integrated Livelihoods Initiative, has operated in urban Haiti. They serve household customers in Capetien and Port-au-Prince. SOIL uses a locally manufactured container-based sanitation, which are then collected weekly, and then washed and recirculated after use. SOIL operates its own treatment facility, so the human manure comes in and is treated they have a zero tolerance for E. coli, and they have month-long processes to turn it into compost. Once it's turned into compost, they can sell it locally. This assists the entire environment because Haiti is deeply in need of topsoil due to massive erosion. Humanure can help provide that. Soil toilets provide people then with access to safe, dignified sanitation through container-based sanitation. Soil provides its own locally sourced organic cover material, which is waste from sugarcane and peanut processing. And they use that in place of water for the flushing. And on their website, they illustrate the poop loop with, cream, with, some, with green doodles. Waste is collected and transported to one of Soil's treatment sites. Waste is transformed into compost through a carefully monitored process that includes thorough lab testing. The finished compost is a valuable resource that nourishes the soil. Plants grown in soil's compost help to reforest and stabilize Haiti's environment. Those plants be bear nutritious organic food for people to eat and then excrete. And it starts again. Their social business model creates jobs along the way that ensure that their impact is truly lasting. From the construction of the eco lacai and the eco mobile toilets to selling compost to harvesting more crops, 
soil creates new value chains that are far reaching and supportive of life's most crucial necessities. Their team is 85% Haitian, 15% international. And compared to the usual waste treatment systems, soil's composting sites emit less greenhouse gases. Soil is also responsible for the majority of waste treatment in Cap Haitian. It was really meaningful to visit soil last week, and I look forward to continuing to learn together with them. While there, I also heard of scalable efforts in Ghana, Uganda, and Peru. So a global conversation is continuing about how to make it possible to have ecological sanitation. We can do it here too. If we think of our daily duty as like a health smoothie for tree roots, then we'll find ways to design for reuse and sanitation that do not compromise the health of our neighbors and future generations. And in turn, this can release the pressure on our systems from population growth in water-rich places like the Midwest, because we know that that will increase due to people internally displaced by climate catastrophe on the coast as they seek refuge here and shelter and services. We have no time to lose to keep innovating. But innovation on this issue turns out to be illegal in many places in the US. Most zoning codes were written under the assumption that best practices of grid piping would remain best practices with only in incremental updates forever and ever. But innovation isn't always incremental, says Molly Winter of Recode. And so groups like Recode work on ecological building design, and they run adv advocacy campaigns to challenge archaic zoning so that closely monitored experiments in closed loop sewage treatment can happen. Recode has had great success so far, receiving some of the first permits of its kind in Oregon to run these experiments. They are currently working on a set of three high-rise residential buildings in downtown Portland, Oregon that do not flush into the sewer system. Their wash water is getting reused to flush toilets in these buildings. The wash water is getting reused to cool mechanical systems. It's getting reused to water the landscape and then flush the toilet. And once all the water has been thoroughly used, it is treated in the highest standards right on site by the plants and bacteria. And then that clean water is infiltrated through the layers of gravel and soil into the groundwater below. Innovating on this front was cheaper than updating the surrounding sewer structure infrastructure. Molly encourages us to join the brave people who looked at the plans for these buildings and decided on on-site reuse. Molly says they simply looked at the cost and they looked at their values and commitments and they said, on-site reuse, this shit makes sense. Let's do it. She says we need to have more conversations like that as we have aging infrastructure all over the place. And it is old. If we look at updating and upgrading for the increased demand, three-fourths of the cost to update and upgrade is just the pipes that go through our cities. And as we renovate, it might make more sense to treat and reuse everything on site. And not forgetting those without adequate sanitation. Every dollar invested in sanitation brings an average of $7 in return, health costs averted and productivity gained. So it's a win-win for everyone. Globally, if universal sanitation were achieved by 2020, it would cost just over 95 billion, but it would save more than $660 billion. And I learned this from this book by Rose George called The Big Necessity, The Unmentionable World of Human Waste and Why It Matters. There's a lot of really great information in here. Getting people to talk about what is taboo can change a community can change a state, can change nations. And since I'm speaking to a crowd of peacemakers and peace builders, the Human Development Report authors noted in their report that when it comes to water and sanitation, the world su suffers from a surplus of conference activity, especially about water, and a deficit of action. 
The 1.8 million child deaths each year related to clean water and sanitation dwarf the casualties associated with violent conflict. No act of terrorism generates economic devastation on the scale of the crisis in water and sanitation. In addition to making economic sense and peacemaking sense, healthy elimination is good for you too throughout the lifespan, but especially as you begin to have aging infrastructure. <laughs> Your poo matters. The sages of long ago uh, understood that a good bowel movement was the key to good health. A lot of stress sits in our guts. And the food that we eat interacts with it, bringing us closer to or further from wholeness with the, each choice that we make. And if we know that the health of our soil increases when we eat healthier, it is yet another motivator to eat fiber and be regular. Speaking from experience, it brings greater relief to my body to know that what I'm putting out will not do damage, but assist in the circle of life. This is where I consider defecatory justice to be connected with food justice, just the back end of it. At Wild Seed Land Community, a black-brown community-led experiment in food sovereignty and solidarity culture, we built a composting toilet there and we called it the Movement Center for Release and Renewal. If religious connection to this topic inspires you, know that religious texts, many of them speak to etiquette and rhythm as it relates to our bowels. In Judaism, there is the Asher Yatsar. It's a prayer recited upon leaving the bathroom. This prayer comes in a series of blessings generally done upon waking up in the morning. It follows on the blessings for the miracle of opening your eyes for the first time, your feet touching the ground for the first time, and generally, you head to the bathroom at that point. Here's how the prayer goes. Blessed are you, Adonai our God. Brucha et Shekinah Elotem. Ruach HaOlam, ruler of the universe who formed humans with wisdom and created us with openings and hollows and tubes. It is clear in the presence of your glorious throne that if one of them were to be ruptured or if one tube were to be blocked, it would be impossible to stand before you and praise you for any length of time. Blessed are you, Adonai, who heals all flesh and acts wondrously. Amen. The humble bowel movement can remind us also of our limited humanness and the creator's greatness. It can remind us of our connection to all things. When participating in indigenous decolonization work alongside First Nation folks in Canada, they challenged some of us about the settler religion that got forced upon them saying, you Christians say, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And we say yes to that. We have also always recognized that humans aren't the only ones in the flow and that it's deeper than that. We say, do unto those downstream as you'd have those upstream do to you. Who is downstream of us? What are they experiencing metaphorically and literally from our disposable heavy society? What does it mean for us to flush our crap onto them? This is the golden rule literally translated into our water system. And Cornell West speaks to the etymological connection between the word bowels and the word compassion in biblical Greek. They come from the same root. We have some constipation in our compassion these days. It's crucial, he says, that our bowels of compassion are moved by what we are observing around us. Again, Rose George in The Big Necessity, the unmentionable world of human waste and why it matters, notes that the material itself that we make is as rich as oil and probably more useful. It contains nitrogen and phosphates that can make plants grow and also suck the life from water because its nutrients ab absorb available oxygen. It can be both food and poison. It can contaminate and cultivate. So we need to be careful and if we can get people to be more comfortable about talking about poop and sanitation, we can have a calm discussion about what we want to do with our waste or what we don't want to. And with proper planning and great attention 
to pay to the industrial and pharmaceutical cross-contaminants? In the future, we could fertilize half or all of our food, depending on our diet. Humanure is brown because there's a lot of carbon in it. And if we get that into the soil, it will bind with minerals in there, as well as absorbing carbon dioxide from the air. And wow, healthier food, and therefore healthier people. Chemical fertilizers, by definition, don't have carbon in them. Imagine if we could move our animal and humanure to our soil, we might not need to rely on fossil fuel-based fertilizers or mined minerals from far away. Imagine how much energy we could save. Imagine how we could help sl slow down global warming and taking the pressure off people who live on the other side of the protection gap, who are in the path of current extractive industries. And we're not there yet or anymore. As there are remote places and cultures that are already practicing defecatory justice, by thinking about where our poop and pee goes, that could be our first step in activating our ability to turn waste into resources and think about how we want to reuse it. This change seems hard to do, but it's necessary for us for it to pass. Transforming our systems is safer than staying with the status quo. Allowing more dollars to flow to address treatable diseases and the lack of ecological sanitation worldwide is imperative. It's also more in line with a possible world to come. The world where people committed to nonviolence, the one we can dream of, the beloved community. Like commitment to nonviolence in all other, other areas, this one, and paying attention to where our poop and our pee goes. This one requires us to do something different than the mainstream and examine our most intimate and routine of actions for how they are contributing to a violent status quo. And if you're a person of faith and interested in eschatology, which is the big word for the study of the end times that I began with, know that it's not such a jump between eschatology and eschatology. Our texts and our best traditions invite us to begin with the end in mind. So the next time you go to the bathroom, at home or when you're traveling, ask yourself, like Molly Winter does, where does my poop and pee go? Will they be gainfully employed? Or will they be wreaking havoc in some waterway somewhere? And if you don't know, find out. And if you don't like the answer, Go to the people who have decision-making power about this in your area and let them know that you have had advanced potty training, that you're ready for reuse and a holistic poop loop. So here I am at the end of the speech anyway, and I feel fine. Uh, some people may, some of you may think I'm full of, well, you know what by now, uh, but I'm really excited for our dialogue now. And, and as I wrote, this, I skimmed reviews from the United Nations recent report that advocates for immediate and urgent action to cur curtail climate emissions. So if you can't hear from me, this is our global report from many advocates that say uh, there is no documented historic precedent for the scale of changes that will be necessary. However, the world has briefly achieved uh, at some rapid changes at regional levels during, area, during eras of great upheaval. And the decade of the 2020s is about to be one of the most important set of years in all of humanity. And commentator Eric Holhouse says, and I agree with him, that we're about to enter one of the most creative, meaningful, and transcendent eras of human history, simply because we must. That makes it an exciting time to be a scientist, a writer, a student, a parent, or really, for purposes of my research and mobilization, it's a good time to be anyone who poops. Because it's a time where it's no longer us versus them, but it's all of us or none. For defecatory justice, everyone and every idea is now a necessary part of the solution. We are all in this together. Thank you.
Sarah, thank you for your wonderful, inspiring, revelatory talk. Mm -hmm. You move seamlessly between environmental language and sanitation language, but historically it seems like these groups have actually been divided. Could you speculate on what the source of that division might be? This is another place where I feel Dr. King's work is very instructive. He was assassinated in response in Memphis, and he was there in response to the sanitation workers who were striking. And Echo Cole and Robert Walker had been crushed in the back of a garbage collection truck when they were not allowed to sit on a rainy day in the front cab with their white colleagues. And what I see in that in so many ways is enduring racism. We think about disposable society and everything is, because everything is connected, it's not a leap if you, see, if you can see yourself as separate from the earth. So when you start to see yourself as separate from other human beings that are not like you for whatever reason. And I think the separation between some of the environmental and social justice movements is really significantly potent within the global north and places that have been the engines for colonization where the ability to separate from the impacts of your actions made it possible for people to, to exist because it's very difficult to, for people to know some of the harms that they're causing sometimes and continue to act in that way. And so as people began to mobilize and want to do conservation movements, particularly people of European descent, you often saw images of the earth or parks and there weren't humans in it and it began to be used or looked at as places for leisure while those people, um, mostly people not European descent, at least in the United States, were still working the land and very connected to it and so did not have a as romanticized understanding of the land. And pretty soon, with the absence of social justice and some of the early conservationist movements in the global north, things like other species, whales, and different types of trees, while very important in and of themselves, began to be valued over the lives of people who lived in those areas as well, or people who that land was taken from. And, and now, actually, in the more current movement, I hear things sometimes like, humans are a disease on this planet, all humans need to go. And I only hear that from predominantly white groups that posit that the way that wealthy societies have expanded is how every, all humans relate to land. And in fact, when in healthy relationship with an ecosystem, humans don't necessarily do damage beyond repair and we're all, and we're all connected. And in the Global South, I've seen amazing examples of people connecting what's happening to them socially with what's happening environmentally. And in response to that, corporations and states are crushing activism and dissent that says, don't cut down the Amazon, you're also killing a culture. We're watching environmental activists in the Global South be targets of assassination at very high rates. And so I think that we should learn from them because they are definitely holding these two um, issues together because they're all just one issue because of the analysis that everything is connected. Thanks, Sarah, for your talk. One last question for you. Um, you mentioned this concept of eco-theology and liberation theology, and I'm wondering if you can say a little bit more about where 
liberation theology, eco theology fits in with your work. Mm -hmm. So when I preach on this topic, the connections between eschatology and eschatology, I actually use 1 Corinthians 12, which is another letter written by radical folks working for that inclusive social change to help keep one another's spirits up. And they were dealing with uh, conflicts within these small groups, as many of us in social movements know. Conflict can be a generative force. And so this 1 Corinthians 12 letter was a reminder that everyone was needed, that no one was disposable from the body. And 1 Corinthians 12 talks about how we are one body and the hand cannot say to the eye, because you're not a hand, I have no need of you. The foot cannot say to the nose, because I'm not a nose, I'm not a part of the body. Rather, we, every piece is needed and the parts that are considered uh, weaker or more vulnerable, actually those are the ones to clothe with greater honor, to pay close attention to. And so the idea that, that everything is connected and that which is not given esteem in society should be given the most esteem, for me, brings together this understanding of our body as one and a critique of, of separation, of separation theology. And so one really helpful concept from deep ecology is just the reminder that, that all is one. And, and so when I think about 1 Corinthians 12, I recognize that that expands even just beyond our physical bodies and humans together, but to our ecological body as well. For example, the trees, they breathe out oxygen and I can breathe in. I breathe out carbon dioxide and they can breathe in that. Like, so I can never say to the trees, I have no need of you. And there's so much uh, about the way in which then that everything that I put out is not waste, but is food for something else. So it's all part of a cycle. And, and so really deeply, deeply dwelling in the oneness and looking at um, the telos or the end um, in our theology, thinking about that as, and also revelation or the end of the world, not, not simply as one stopping final moment, but really revolving much like the earth itself. What are we turning to? What can we turn what's coming out of us into? How can we feed ourselves well on this planet? And so the liberation theology uh, and deep ecology come together for liberation ecology and recognition of